we are at one of those pivot points in history that is not unlike in some ways the era of the 1770s, the era of the 1860s, uh, and the era of the 1930s. And uh, it's not that I can't look away, it's that I, you know, because of my neurology or something, it's that I don't want to look away. I mean, because I want, this is critical stuff. Which raises uh, one of the pieces that I wrote. I, I published this on November 30th. I don't know what day of the week it was, but that was last week. I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday of last week. And I spent a couple of hours actually writing, you know, just doing the research on writing this thing. I spent a lot of the day in, in, in my room uh, working on this article because I thought it was so important. And uh, I, in fact, I think it was probably one of the most important things I've read recently. So let me just run through my thinking on this. And it's, it's asking the question, and what got me started on this is I subscribed to Robert Reich's uh, Substack newsletter, uh, which is brilliant. It's robertreich.substack.com, and the former labor secretary. And he published a newsletter, I think it was on Monday of last week, that said, why are so many people prepared to vote for Trump? And then he had a little questionnaire where you can, you know, click a button to ch make your choice. And his choices were, uh, are people voting for this wannabe dictator because of ignorance? because of anger and, or fear, because of racism or xenophobia, or because of Biden's age. And, you know, my take on it is those are all, no doubt, significant factors. But I think the biggest variable is something quite different in the American landscape right now that is, uh, that I have seen a transformation of in my, li in my lifetime. And I say this as somebody who worked in, and I'm talking about news, and I say this as somebody who has worked in news virtually my entire life. Um, when I was 16, I got my first real job uh, at uh, WITL AM and FM, WITL AM and FM, Lansing, Michigan, um, you know, back in, what, 19, uh, I was 16, I guess, 1967. And uh, I, that was as a weekend DJ, but within two years at that same radio station, I was doing news every morning. I went in every morning from, from 5 a.m. until 10 a.m. And, uh, and, and in fact, several days a week, I'd stop at the uh, city hall on the way in and check the police blotter and interview the mayor and stuff like that. And uh, I did that for almost seven years on WITL, on and off, uh, that, that morning news gig. And uh, this was in the 1960s and early 1970s. It was kind of a part-time job for me then. I also, uh, Terry and I, uh, Terry O'Connor and I had started a, an herbal tea company. We were run, running a business on the side and, and he had an ad agency that I was uh, a part of. But news was very different then. I mean, back then we had uh, two, two uh, guardrails in place that have since been removed. The first was the Fairness Doctrine, and I've talked about this many times in this program, and I won't go into a long rant about it. The Fairness Doctrine is not what most people think. Most people think that the Fairness Doctrine, if it were still into effect, would mean that if a station carries now of Rush Limbaugh, or now, nowadays Sean Hannity, now that Rush is no longer with us, um, that they had to carry an hour of me. And it's not, exa it's not at all what it said. What it said, though, was that stations did have to do something called programming in the public interest. And that was understood, and, and you had to do, if you'd fail to do this, every year or every two years when your radio or television station license was up for renewal, uh, they examined that. Are you programming in the public interest? And if you weren't, you could lose your license. And so what was broadly understood to be programming in the public interest was real news. And so CBS, ABC, NBC, all, of, all three of the television networks, and, and the radio networks, uh, all lost money on news. Now, the radio networks lost it because they were buying their news from, from you know, news sources like the Associated Press, uh, but they still had to pay for news. So for every, all the media agencies, mo news was a money-losing operation. I mean, they lost millions of dollars every year, um, but they wanted to have really good, high-quality news. So they had bureaus all over the world and real reporters and journalistic standards and all this kind of stuff. That was essentially mandated by, by the Fairness Doctrine, at least mandated for one hour, five days a week on television, the first prime time hour, which had to be a half, half hour national, half hour local news. And it was mandated for radio stations that, was, that were running actual news, five minutes of news at the top of every hour, something that sort of endures to this day, but not everywhere. And um, so that was number one. And number two 
was in 1996, Bill Clinton signing the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which blew apart what were called cross ownership and mass ownership rules. It used to be that if you owned a radio station in a particular town, you couldn't also own the television station and the newspaper. Uh, or if you did, there were all kinds of restrictions on you know, how you could involve yourself. And if you had you know, 10 or 12 radio stations, well, Clear Channel was a little group in, in a couple of southeastern states of uh, a couple of dozen radio stations. And that was, the, you know, that was the, one of the largest of the, of the uh, networks. And the Telecommunications Act of 96 blew up those ownership rules. And so, you know, within a year, Clear Channel had over 900 stations. And, and, uh, and, and, and within a year of Reagan stopping the enforcement of the Fairness Doctrine in 1986, I believe it was, maybe 87, um, within a year of that, ABC, NBC, and CBS had all moved their news divisions under their, out of being independent standalone uh, operations within their networks, to being answerable to their vice president of entertainment programming. In other words, they became money-making operations. Now, if you're running news as a money-making operation, the actuality, the reality, the details of what's going on in the world that, that you know, those of us who have a background in news would say, yeah, that's news, that's important stuff, people need to know that, those become irrelevant. What becomes relevant is what's going to get the most eyeballs, what's going to get the most clicks, what's going to draw the most viewers which takes us back to an era in the 1890s when William Randolph Hearst decided that he was going to take on Joseph Pulitzer, who owned a, then the, the dominant newspaper in the United States. It was called the New York World, and it was pretty much real journalism, although Pulitzer was starting to flirt with yellow journalism. But in 1895, William Randolph Hearst opened uh, a newspaper uh, in... in uh, in New York City that just blew out the door. And in fact, he hired away a, a cartoonist from, from, um, from Pulitzer. The guy's name was Richard Aukalt. And he published a, 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 a cartoon called The Yellow Kid. And that was where the phrase yellow journalism came from because he left Hertz and he went to, or he left uh, Pulitzer and went with Hertz, Hertz. And So basically ever since the 1895, we've had this phrase yellow journalism and we pretty much had this sensation-driven kind of journalism in the United States right up until the mid-1940s. Um, certainly, you know, the, the, the point that's typically identified, and there have been a number of actual, you know, serious scholarship books written about this um, uh, over the years. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the turning point seems to be we had ye yellow journalism essentially from 1895 until 1945. Till Pearl Harbor. And then from 1945 until the Reagan era, we had this 40 year period of actual news, almost 50 years of actual news. And Americans were well informed. I mean, yeah, there were things that we weren't talking about that we should have been talking about. And, you know, there were, I, 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 it's easy to criticize the news from that era. But when you compare it to today, I think it's kind of apples and oranges. And this is the problem that we have today is this modern era of yellow journalism. And I track this back to the 1990s when Ken Starr and Newt Gingrich decided to go after Bill Clinton on, on the Monica Lewinsky affair. And in part, they were able to do that because, you know, Reagan had ended the Fairness Doctrine. And this was in the middle of the era when the 1996 Telecommunications Act was, was uh, passed. Limbaugh's show went on the air in 1988. Rupert Murdoch's Fox News went on the air in 1996, same year as the, as the Telecommunications Act. And what I would argue is that, you know, all those things that Robert Reich was proposing are legitimate. You know, people are upset and people are afraid and people, you know, all those reasons uh, why they might vote for Trump, you know, that they're uninformed. That, but, but my argument is that it's not any of those specific emotions. My argument is that it is our media itself. We are in an era that I would describe as a renaissance of yellow journalism, of the journalism from 1895 to 1945. And if you're old enough to remember the news prior to the mid to late 1980s, if you're old enough to remember the news in the 1970s and early 80s, and certainly the 60s, 
um, which as I said, I remember well, I, I did for seven years uh, on the air every day or every weekday. If you remember that, then you know what I'm talking about. You know how different the news is today. You get, you know, and it's like the media is incapable of like chewing gum and walking at the same time. We're, you know, we're all hearing about Israel and the Middle East. What happened to the coverage of, of what's going on in Ukraine? I mean, the, the, the fate and future of democracy in the world to a, to a significant extent, in my opinion, depends on what's going on in Ukraine. Been no coverage of that. And this, but, you know, that's kind of a side note. The, the, where I started with this is why do people not think Biden's doing a great job? Why do people not think that the economy is doing great when the economic numbers now are better than they've been since the 1960s by most indexes? And I would argue because yellow journalism, if it bleeds, it leads. Yellow journalism cares not about what's going on, not about the facts, not about the reality, but about what's going to get clicks. What kind of headline is going to get the highest click-through rate so that they can display an ad to you? What kind of rant is going to get, you know, is going to go viral on the internet so that, again, they can display an ad to you or, or increase their brand awareness and power? And we need to get back to real news in the United States. And frankly, I think the only way to do it is to shame the media. So start reaching out. Comment on their comments. Write the letters to the editor. Let them know you want real news. This is the Tom Hartman Program. 18 minutes past the hour. I'll be right back. Stay with us.